Whoops. Well, good afternoon, members and uh, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream. Welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council Scrutiny and Overview Committee. My name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, and I am the chair of this committee. Um, but members, as we are on the 11th day of the 11th month, uh, I would like to start this meeting with uh, a minute silence in view of those who uh, lost their lives in conflicts. Uh, so therefore I ask you if you're able to please stand with me for a minute while we remember. Thank you all very much. Uh, members, can I remind you that uh, everything on your desk in this room may be broadcast at some point. The camera will follow the microphone being switched on. So both councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking just to allow the camera to catch up. If the fire alarm should sound, then please leave the chamber by the door near the top table and make your way down the stairs. And do not use the lift. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway along the business park. And may I remind those who are joining the meeting via the live stream, please indicate your wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Make sure your device is fully charged, that you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to do otherwise. Please ensure that you've switched off or silenced any other devices you may have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Please use the headset if available and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on and when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Please speak slowly and clearly and do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Please note that if we do need to take a, need to vote on any item, we shall do so via the microphones, but only those present in the chamber may vote or propose or second recommendations. Uh, committee members present in the chamber I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. The members, after I call your name, please turn on your camera and microphone. Wait two seconds and say your name so that your presence may be noted. As I said earlier, my name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain and I am the member for Hardwick. My vice chair is Councillor Judith Ripley. I'll now run through the name call, if I may. Uh, firstly, Councillor Anna Bradman. Good afternoon, uh, members. Uh, I can't remember what my name is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Anna Bradnam, member for Milton and Woodbridge. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. <laughs> Councillor Martin Kahn, member for Piston in Pinkin and Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Oh, well done. <laughs> Councillor Cathcart has just walked through the door. Councillor Graham Cohn. Graham, I think, is not with us at this time. Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Um, yes, uh, good evening, Chairman. Uh, I'm Claire Daunton, and I'm one of the members for the Fenditton and Fullbourne Ward. Thank you. 
Councillor Peter Fain. Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you. Councillor Sally Ann Hart. Good evening, Chair. Sally Ann Hart, one of the councillors for Melbourne North. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Jeff Harvey, I'm the member for Borsham Ward. Councillor Steve Hunt. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is Steve Hunt. I'm one of the members for Histon and Dinton North Trust Park. Thank you. Councillor Aidan van der Wey. Good evening. Um, I'm Aidan van der Wey. I represent the villages of the Barrington Ward. Good evening. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. I don't think Richard is with us yet. Um, and may I ask, are there any other members present, please? I see from the Cabinet we have... Oh, my apologies. <laughs> Councillor Judith Rippon. Um, good evening. I'm Vice Chair of this committee and I'm one of the members for the Milton and Waterbeach Ward and I'm Judith Ripper. Thank you. And we have uh, from the Cabinet, Councillor Jimmy Hawkins and I believe that Councillor John Batchelor is online and from about 5.20 this evening we shall be joined by uh, Councillor John Williams. Councillor Batchelor, good evening to you. Yes, good evening. Uh, John Batchelor, Councillor Flinton, and uh, lead cabinet member for housing. Thank you. Have I missed anyone out? Anyone else out, I should say? No? Good. Thank you very much. Sorry? Councillor Jimmy Hawkins, would you care like to introduce yourself, please? Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Jimmy Hawkins, Councillor for uh, Caldicott Ward and I'm the lead cabinet member for planning policy and delivery. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I can, I'm happy to confirm that our meeting is quorate, um, and I'm delighted that we're able to be here this evening. It was only yesterday afternoon that we appreciated, I'll come back in one moment, uh, that we realized that this meeting room had been, the work had been finished earlier than expected, and that has enabled us to come back into the meeting this evening. So many thanks to Liz and to Aaron for uh, making the arrangements at such, such short notice. Thank you. Councillor Bradman, my apologies. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to invite Councillor Cathcart to introduce himself since he's now seated. Councillor Cathcart, would you care to introduce yourself, please, so for the record? Thank you. Yes, uh, no, Councillor Nigel Cathcart, member for the Bassing Board Award. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, members, if anyone leaves the meeting at any time, would you please make that fact known so that it can be recorded in the minutes. Item two on the agenda is apologies for absence. Uh, Ian, can I ask if we have received any apologies, please? We have just one from Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson. Thank you very much. I can't have a substitute, so just one apology. Thank you very much. Item three is declarations of interest. May I ask, do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? And let, let me say, if an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please raise it at that point. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bradman. Um, I, it's just occurred to me it may be appropriate to point out that I'm a member of the um, planning development group. Um, I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but yeah, at least it's a declaration. We'll make a note of it anyway. Thank you very much. So, item four on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. That was held on Thursday the 14th of October. Can we just um, check them for accuracy, please? On page one, page two, Page three, page four, and page five. Uh, may I take it that we are agreed that they are a true record? Agreed. And that they can be approved appropriately? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, item five on the agenda is public questions, and I can confirm that there are no public questions for us to deal with this evening. 
And therefore, we move straight to item six on the agenda, which is the uh, planning performance follow-up review. And I'm not sure whether it's Stephen Kelly is leading on this or whether Councillor Hawkins. Jonathan Tully. Jonathan Tully. My apologies. Jonathan. Hello. Hello. Good evening, Chair. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for having me uh, back uh, to the committee. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Jonathan. I'm the head of uh, internal audits for the council. Um, so I just wanted to introduce the report. So we're going straight into page seven of your agenda packs. Um, the purpose of this is to inform the committee on our latest review of planning performance management. We have previously reported uh, back to you in April 2021 on planning performance. And as part of that review, we agreed to complete a follow up review to evaluate the implementation of the uh, management actions which had been agreed. So our report summarizes that work and uh, we're asking the committee to note the contents of our report, which is included at Appendix A. So the um, report in Appendix A, I suppose I'd start off by drawing your attention to page 10, where we cover the scope and objectives. Um, so our previous report provided limited assurance following a review of planning data from April to June 2020. And that review gave us the opportunity to identify actions to help improve risks and controls. So our objective simply was to review and see if those revised controls had been implemented. And we wanted to aim to substantiate um, the implementation of the controls by testing data from the next available quarter, which was April to June 2021. So next on the report, I would draw your attention to page 12, uh, the summary of findings. And looking firstly at the statistical analysis, our first observation when we were reviewing the data was that there was a significant increase in, in decisions in the period compared to the previous data set that we reviewed. In terms of data accuracy, um, it's going well. Um, we did identify a difference which was just due to interpretation and roundings of calculations. Um, I would clarify this was an immaterial difference. We show it in the report just for clarity, um, but nothing to worry about. And we did make one recommendation previously about retaining data exports for business continuity, um, and we were happy that that was um, agreed and implemented. The next thing I would uh, like to talk about was the data quality and supporting information. So we sample test and reviewed data quality to help evaluate the effectiveness of the controls. Pleased to see evidence that the agreed management controls have been implemented, um, and that will definitely help the performance management process going forwards. We did sample test data for compliance, and there were still cases from the quarter where the new processes had not been adopted. But just for context, two things to consider. Um, the controls were implemented in the middle of the quarter, and some of the applications would have been submitted from previous quarters. So the new controls wouldn't have come into effect for those. But we report that just for full clarity because we were reviewing the immediate quarter. And it was worth doing that because we wanted to quickly see um, that the controls had been implemented. So we never expected to see the full compliance in the quarter, but just make sure the controls were there. On page 14, um, we uh, summarise the management action process. We hope that's an easy way to digest how the team have progressed from the previous reports and we summarise the implementation status for the actions. So you can see from that one action at a high level has been implemented, which is very positive. Um, three actions have been implemented during the quarter, um, but as the data contains applications from um, before the dates the controls were set up, um, we've recorded this as being in progress rather than fully completed, but it's very reasonable to expect improved compliance going forwards. Um, then we get to um, page 15 where we have our conclusion and based on the processes and data that we reviewed in that period, we've provided reasonable assurance that controls operating effectively. And that is an improvement from our, our previous report that we, we brought to you back in April. 
Um, so that was all I was going to uh, talk through, but happy for any questions or comments that you have. Discussion by members. Can I just say that um, we are, we do recognise that this report is produced during what is a challenging period with the uh, pandemic with staff shortages as a result of difficult recruitment um, and, and also, of course, part way through the period, a change in the um, computer software that's been used. So with that in mind, the uh, comments from my colleagues are all meant, will all be that of a critical friend and are designed to be helpful. Um, and I hope that uh, that is the spirit in which they're taken. Thank you. So, members, Councillor van der Weyer. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, this report, report has been um, extremely useful, um, especially in conjunction with the um, report on the, uh, the uh, next item, to giving us a, a sort of overview of what's happening in the, in the planning service. Um, I felt the information in it was very helpful. And, um, I mean, I, I certainly, my reading of this is that the process of doing this, this audit has been helpful for the service um, as well, and, and that'd be... So useful to get an um, idea about that. Um, uh, the, the my sort of question, if, if you like, is, is what, what happens next with this? Um, uh, this feels like a, a completed um, piece of work. Uh, obviously, with an issue like planning performance, it's something that we're never going to take our eye off the ball on. Uh, we're always going to be paying attention to it, both ourselves and the public. So I, I think if, if we didn't carry this forward, I think I'd be satisfied that we weren't going to um, allow things to to to, to to revert or anything, and, and if there was any sense of, of um, uh, any issues coming up, we, we would uh, um, quite willingly um, uh, take them up again, and, and whether we ask for something similar again or, or not. So um, I, I, I'm very happy just to accept this and, um, uh, uh, and move on. Thank you. That's helpful. Councillor Bradman. Oh, sorry. Can't get me. Yeah. Councillor My apologies. Councillor um, Dalton. Yes, I was really going to make much the same point that Councillor Dewire has, Van de Wire has made, um, but also to ask um, what you've done here. Is it reasonably common in um, other local authorities to do this kind of exercise and to repeat the exercise at regular intervals? Uh, thank you. Um, I personally, uh, from experience, I know that a lot of councils don't complete internal audits of planning data that regularly. Um, it is worth looking at periodically. Um, what we, uh, our approach um, to identifying audit work is that we have a, a sort of risk-based plan and we try and identify what are the areas which would benefit most from having uh, an audit because we can't look at everything in a single year. Um, so as we see controls improve and we get positive assurance, um, there's going to be less demand, less uh, likelihood that we'd want to complete a review there. Can I just note that Councillor Dr Richard Williams has joined us. Good evening Richard, would you just like to introduce yourself for the record please? Nice to see you. Welcome. Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Mr Tully for a very uh, comprehensive report. And it's interesting to hear that it's not necessarily every authority that does it, but thank you very much because I think it gives us great reassurance that you have... Um, considered the, the matters that we need to consider and are giving us a good steer about how to uh, ad address them and that we're taking good steps towards improving things. So um, I'm very grateful for this report and I'm also very encouraged to see that the works that are being proposed and towards template letters so that communications should not be ambiguous or confusing and I think that's a great help. So thank you very much and I, I shall pick this up under the next item. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Steve Hunt. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, with regard to the EOTA 
um, recommendations about using fields in the uniform system. Um, it's good to see that they are starting to be used, but clearly not comprehensively, as I think it says here on page 13, that um, the sampling did not contain a decision with all three fields completed. And I just wondered why the system lets you do that. Um, can they not be made compulsory or something done, such as even peer review, frankly, by somebody else casting an eye over it, just to make sure those are actually being done as opposed to just an effort being made? Okay, um, I, I, I can't say if it can be configured to make those fields mandatory. Um, but what I would say is, uh, again, the, the records that were looked at, there certainly would have been um, early stages of them uh, implementing the new processes. So, I mean, we, we have made reference also on that page that it would be good practice to issue refresher training uh, to help embed it. It needs to become second nature, doesn't it, to fill in these fields. Thank you, Chair. Well, well, just just to highlight, yes, we have obviously since the um, sampling was done by by uh, Jonathan and his his colleagues, we we're obviously reinforcing that point. We have done a comprehensive system audit of the IDOCS software solution with um, our kind of partners uh, in the transformation journey uh, to to try and understand how we can get. Uh, exactly the point that Councillor Hunt raises, uh, a proper and full compliance and assurance from uh, from the systems uh, and what uh, the IDOC solution can uh, achieve. Uh, so it is something that, that, that we're actively exploring whether we're, in a sense we can prevent progression through to uh, the final decision phase uh, by uh, making the field uh, completion mandatory. Of course, the issue is, is not every application has an extension of time. Uh, and uh, and so there are some uh, elements to which it would, if you if you had to give a reason for the extension of time in order to allow the system to progress, and 60% of the applications didn't have an extension of time, um, we might find that we're building in extra problems into the into the system either way. But it's certainly something that we're in the planning service obviously committed to. We want you to feel assured about the performance figures that we're putting forward. Uh, and, um, you know, we're working with uh, IDOCS and the transformation team uh, to try and find the, the, the most effective way of doing so. Thank you very much. You. Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you, Chair. As you said in prefacing this, it was a particularly difficult period for planning officers. And because of the number of variations, inevitably the period being audited is almost certainly not typical in terms of outcomes. Um, clearly the, the key outcomes are those in relation to the number of applications determined within the statutory period, whether or not there's an EOTA in those cases. That's uh, very interesting data on page 12. Um, I just wonder, there is obviously a limit to the number of times, the number of issues that the internal audit team can look at each time. Um, but I wonder whether we need to look at these data again in the future and whether perhaps the IDOC system enables that to be done more easily. Um, to some extent, Stephen Kelly was addressing that point just now. But I, I, it would be helpful to know how we keep an eye on this important issue as hopefully more typical times um, come in. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Just if anybody didn't catch it online, I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Wittlesford. I'm sorry I was late. Um, I, I, obviously, I, I missed the, the, the introduction to this item, and I, I, a number of the points I was going to mention have already been raised, so I won't go over them again. But I did just want to thank uh, Mr. Tully for doing this. I wanted to thank the Chief Executive as well um, for, for ensuring this report came, because I think it was after a comment I made in a in the previous scrutiny meeting that this got picked up. So, so thank, thank you all for doing that. Um, I've got some comments on uh, the substance of planning performance, which I, I think I'll keep to the next item. I, I will just say one point though, and it does come off what um, Councillor Fain has just said. I, I mean, I don't think we need to keep going back and doing audits in the past, but I think just from some admittedly unscientific analysis I've done. I think this was an issue before 
2020, if you go back and look at applications, um, you know, EOTs are not recorded and, and th there's no evidence of them. I think that's probably common ground. But I think we don't need really to look back. I think we need to look, look, look forward. Um, and I was pleased to see the action points. Um, and I would just uh, like to say I'd, I'd, I'd be very pleased to see those um, being implemented as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen. From your building site. Uh, Chair, I'd, uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't have anything further to, uh, okay. to, to add. Thank you. Councillor Jim Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just to, if I may, um, through you, add my thanks to Mr. Tully for the work that's been done. Um, the, it was mentioned about you know doing an audit like this um, a number of times and do we really need to. Um, that's been answered, but I am thankful that this has been done. I think um, just to put that in context, this is a shared service that was put into place very recently. Um, it was not until 2019 that you know the, the processes actually became or we tried to make them into one. Um, we are currently undergoing a transformation project um, to enable us actually streamline what were two processes into one. Um, so it has not been an easy time. And I just want to say thank you to all the officers because I know how hard they have been working. Uh, some really silly hours to the extent that's why they were taking, you know, they, they can't take the time off they need to make up for, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the time they've built up. Um, but we certainly, uh, I'm sure, will be at some point, as agreed, bring to you the performance going forward. Yes, there were issues, but we are now implementing lots of things to improve the service. And I think you will agree that there has been improvement and there will continue to be because our aim is to be the best planning service in the country. That's what we're aiming for and we will get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Cathcart. Thank you. Yes, I mean, it seems to be a good report. It's quite comprehensive um, and there's really room for improvement. And then there always is uh, in any organisation on any issue. Um, just, uh, I mean, having spent half my life doing all that, some sort of another, I'm, I'm aware that one can often, if you like, concentrate on process and compliance rather than quality. And quality is an incredibly difficult thing to measure. Uh, it's probably no part of the audit department's brief anyway to do that. But as I say, in my experience, you can easily lose sight of when quality and planning decisions is, as I say, difficult to measure. Things like customer satisfaction, I suppose, making sure we are compliant with policies and, and, um, and that we are actually moving the whole thing forward. So it's actually not easy to measure. But I'm just wondering whether in this whole process of audit, quality does actually feature in any way, and is it measurable? <laughs> Probably isn't. I thought that made the call. <laughs> Stephen, did you wish to uh, respond to that? Uh, through you, Chair, yes, I, I, I can. I, I, I think absolutely, uh, and, and one of the big uh, challenges, I suppose, is that the government's metric, which is uh, decisions within time uh, or with an agreed extension of time that doesn't really touch uh, the user experience at all uh, and it is a statistical process uh, and you know we we know full well that we've still got a journey to go on in terms of uh, the user experience but um, we're not essentially sitting on our laurels in determination of a uh, government metric uh, and using that to judge the quality of the service my, my teams are striving really hard uh, to make the user experience uh, and as well as from a management perspective from my uh, a employee experience uh, as, as rewarding and constructive a, a, as possible and that's that's actually at the heart of the transformation program uh, that we're working on with um, the transformation teams in both councils uh, and it and it's at the cornerstone of of, of the, the brief that we have given to um, our partners in that in that process as we go forwards. So um, I absolutely agree with Councillor Cathcart. It isn't a number that defines the quality, it's the experience of the users. Uh, and, and we're trying to think really hard about 
at how we can put a, a, a more effective metric than the national performance uh, figures uh, around that. Thank you very much. Nigel, would you mind turning your microphone on, please? And I think Councillor Jeff Harvey, did you? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Well, really just um, following on from Stephen Kelly's point and, and um, from the point of view of a, a customer, um, and I think it's good that we're getting um, in the direction of, of more and more of these um, extension of time um, reasons given. Um, but I just wondered, because I think sometimes it happens that um, because the department is under such pressure, it, en it ends up that everything is compressed into the last you know, couple of weeks of the, um, the, the, the initial time for determination. And, and then, of course, um, whilst the client would agree that an extension of time uh, is necessary, um, you know, got to sort of maybe break down how, how one arrived at that point. So I, I just think it would be quite useful to kind of try and capture that in some way, but I'm not, I'm not sure how. Thank you. Uh, and I welcome, if I may, Councillor Graham Cohn, who has just joined us online. Thank you, Graham. Good evening. Thanks very much, Chairman. I'm not sure that we have any more speakers. Has uh, everyone finished with this? In which case, may I say, Jonathan, thank you very much for the work that you've done. Um, we have noted your report um, and you've heard the comments which are um, all very favourable. We thank you for the work you've done. And Stephen, may I uh, ask you to convey our thanks to your colleagues uh, for the work that they have done uh, in getting us to this position. And we look forward to uh, the continuing improvement. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is item seven, which is uh, planning performance overview for the period from 1st of September 2019 to the 30th of September 2021. And my comments in relation to the previous item also apply to this because, of course, uh, the similar uh, issues uh, were prevalent in this period, i.e. Uh, the pandemic, uh, challenges in recruiting staff, and also a change of system. Um, but I'll now call upon Councillor Chimney Hawkins, if she would be so kind as to introduce her paper. Chimney. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I think a lot, we have said a lot about uh, the background to um, you know, extensions of time issues, which I think is what this is about. It was a request that was made at the last full council meeting by Councillor Heather Williams. Um, and um, we were asked to uh, present this data to show um, if I can, as stated at the next full council, oh sorry, at, a, at the next meeting of full council, it's going to be presented to council in relation to planning performance, showing number of applications determined within statutory period, how many had extensions agreed and how many were waiting determination at the end of each month to cover the last 24 months. That was the request. And that is what we've brought to you um, as agreed at full council. Um, if I may just say it's sort of a general um, uh, preface to this is that across the country and here especially, applications are increasing. And it is not unusual for us to have a certain number of applications at the beginning of a period and to find that even though we've met all the criteria and you know, sent things out, we still have more at the end of that specific period. So applications are increasing across the board. Um, but also we have looked at, and I don't know, this is not in your report, but just to let you know that we have looked at uh, the use of extensions of time um, by other authorities neighboring authorities. And just as an example, for major applications, um, we have a figure of 77% usage of extensions of time. East Cams has 93%. Uh, Peterborough has 80%. Uh, 
Hans, 87%. <laughs> Finland, 68%. That's for majors. We are not um, exceptional in the use of extensions of time. Uh, and for non-majors, and this is you know, reported, we are averaging 50% for the non-majors. East Camps is 46, Finland is 29, Peterborough is 46, Hans is 58, and West Suffolk is 42. So, you know, use of extensions of time is part and parcel of um, the application process. Um, but I'll, I think I've said enough for now. And we will take our questions, please, as they come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, Councillor Bradman. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm very uh, interested to hear the comparison with other authorities. And thank you for providing us with that comparison, because I think that probably um, illustrates to us uh, what difficult times all planning authorities are going through, particularly with pandemic and particularly with the amount of um, development that a number of counties are and districts are needing to deal with. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to um, draw out of that, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at the data on um, page 40, um, about the minor applications and extensions of time. And this is not actually to do with extensions of time. It's actually to do with the amount of time taken, maybe accidentally. Uh, and I just wanted us to be mindful that whilst, obviously, the majors um, have a big impact on our statistics, the minors have an absolutely huge and sometimes life-changing impact on our residents, because this can be the individual sale of a house where somebody is hanging on, waiting for information, desperate to sort out some planning or legal nicety, which means that they, in a particular case, uh, you know, in, in my ward where um, a resident has had to sell the house that he lives in, in order to ensure his sale. Um, but is not yet able to be sure that he can buy the, bu the building that he really wants to bu buy close by. And he's having to do that on a wing and a promise on the hope that the information that he has provided to the planning office is now uh, adequate and what they needed. And that has been a time of absolute sheer anxiety for him and his new family. Um, and so I just want to be reassured from the planning authority that, that we are mindful of the impact that delays in time, even on minor applications, can cause to our residents. And this, this involves often, you know, needing to uh, rent another property while you can be sure that you can move into something else. So um, it's just to be, I, I think one of the things is I would like to know whether there are any plans for um, addressing the matter, and I know it's difficult, but the matter of communication, whilst that delay period is going on, if there's a genuine reason, um, you know, are, are there ways in which we plan to keep in touch with those residents who've been waiting for an answer from the planning authority, maybe for good reason, um, <coughs> so just to keep them uh, reassured that you're still on their radar and you haven't sort of completely forgotten them, because they do appreciate you're horribly busy, or we are horribly busy, but they would just like to know where their applications got to. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, did you wish to respond to that? Uh, yes, as best I can. Um, and perhaps Mr Kelly can um, add to it. We do encourage our officers um, to respond to requests uh, and to communicate. Customer service is one of the things that we keep harping on. And I say harp because I do the same. In fact, I still was part of, I attended one of the team meetings on Monday. And one of the things I said was, please, please carry, can you please make sure that you respond? Uh, because as you rightly point out, Councillor Bradman, uh, some of the, what you call the minor, or I would say household applications, and in fact, I think 80% of our work is household applications. 
um, we're mindful that they are uh, they affect people. This is on. <laughs> um, so yes, and the other thing we try and do is encourage applicants to actually uh, register on the um, customer portal and monitor their applications from there. Um, I'm not sure that many of them do, but I would like to see us, um, if that is something that is not being taken up as it should, perhaps um, we can focus a bit more on encouraging them to do so, so that they can actually monitor um, their applications without actually coming through to planning officers. And of course, that's, you know, that's one of the features of the new planning software that we bought, because we thought, you know, it's, if they can do that, then they don't have to keep trying to contact. Um, but I know we all like talking to people. It's, it's second nature. And just so you know, um, we have been told that we are using IDOC's uniform um, very efficiently, much more than other organizations or councils are. So we're trying our best to make sure that we do communicate and communicate effectively. Well, I know we have a long way to go, but we are improving. Thank you. Uh, I gather Stephen Kelly would like to come in. Stephen. Th thank you, Chair. Um, really just to build on, on Councillor Hawkins' uh, comments, but also Councillor Cathcart's uh, comments in respect of the previous item. Uh, we absolutely recognise that one of the biggest challenges that people um, have, have had uh, over the last couple of years is um, uh, understanding and finding out where their applications are. And we've invested in a um, uh, review of our software to see how that can help. I think, you know, that there is, um, as, the, as I'm sure the, the, the report hopefully makes clear, there isn't complacency in the planning service around the challenges we, we, we face. Uh, we have got a transformation programme that is uh, working alongside uh, the teams to, to, to think really hard about the most effective way of communicating with people. Uh, because in some respects, if they have to phone us up to find out what's happening, in many respects, our systems and processes have, have already failed because either we haven't made the decision soon enough uh, or indeed they're not able to secure information uh, in, a, in a more uh, accessible format, either online or by phoning our contact centres. So we are looking um, in depth at, at, at ways in which we can make the software work even harder for us, um, how we can help their agents and their planning um, consultants uh, to uh, access more uh, information uh, and, um, uh, and, and how we can, can work so that in many respects, they don't have to uh, phone to chase because we're making decisions uh, sooner uh, and, more, and more quickly. Um, but the, the reality that the report uh, paints out is, that, as you can see, the, the focus has, has been trying to uh, deal with a very substantial volume of applications, some eight and a half, uh, nearly 9,000 applications we've had in the last two years. And of course, that's South Cambridgeshire. On top of that, there's another six and a half thousand that we've been dealing with for the City Council. Uh, and, and I would be the first to, to hold my hand up. And, and I know my officers um, have been really challenged about this. The, 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 the quantum of, of um, uh, applications uh, that we have been uh, trying to pro process through, not always with the easiest of, of circumstances, but I'm not going to make um, uh, that a, a, an excuse for um, the communications uh, on itself. But the, um, the focus of the service has been trying to continue to provide the service because we do recognise that um, local residents uh, and indeed local businesses uh, uh, need to make important decisions as, as, uh, in a timely way. Uh, so we're not we're not at all complacent uh, and um, the focus is, as I said earlier, about the user experience of the planning service uh, rather than uh, tick boxes in terms of um, planning application performance uh, because we want to make it make it meaningful and, we, and you know me and my officers know we need uh, people to feel better and more confident about it. Right, Stephen. Councillor Peter Fain. Uh, thank you, Chair. My uh, question relates to um, paragraph 18. Um, we all understand why it's been necessary to introduce the no amendments approach to try and reduce the amount of time that was being spent on numerous amendments in some cases. And as it says here, it's too early to assess the impact this is likely to have, including, of course, on the number of... Um, extensions of time. 
I just wonder whether this might also make the system less flexible, that amendments that might easily have been agreed between case officers and application applicants that would have made a case capable of approval, um, because those can no longer be amended, the applicants may be tempted to withdraw them and resubmit in a slightly different form, which could actually increase the overall workload. And I just wonder to what extent that is a factor and whether it will be possible to monitor that. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think I will leave Mr. Kelly to um, answer this one because um, there's a lot to it. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Fain's absolutely right. There is potentially a risk. Um, one of the uh, one of the issues that I suppose we're balancing, and one of the issues that the report highlights, uh, and from the analysis that we've done, is is in um, paragraph. I'm sorry, it's not numbered, but it would be paragraph 20. We highlight the fact that we're currently carrying um, 1,278 planning applications, or we were at the end of, of September, and a number of those applications, in fact, are applications that have amendments, or the applicant is seeking to amend it, or they require uh, modification. Uh, and one of the one of the dilemmas that, in many respects, the service faces is that when you translate that into what might be a sustainable caseload for officers. Some of our officers' caseloads are probably double what might be seen as a sustainable caseload because they have a lot of paused work where we are seeking amendments uh, and um, uh, either waiting for further information and, and, and so on. And the effect of that is a bit like a, uh, trying to drag a chain down the road. For those of you that have got a very big in tray or um, don't uh, have got a lot of files in your in tray, uh, it's incredibly challenging for officers to manage about 150 or so cases, uh, where some of half of which may well be awaiting amendments and uh, and so on. So we are, uh, uh, it is a pilot effectively, we are trying to explore whether or not by introducing greater discipline to the process, uh, applicants are firstly encouraged to get the application right first time, because if you have an unlimited amendment policy, there's absolutely no incentive for either the applicant or indeed their architect or designer to get it right first time. Uh, and um, uh, and equally to try and recognise that those people that take the effort to do so uh, uh, take, uh, are able to take advantage of a faster process because we are more efficient uh, at, pro, uh, at, at throughput. The, the flip side of that, as Councillor Fain highlights, is the risk that um, applications get uh, withdrawn or refused uh, uh, and resubmitted. Uh, but um, there is an element to which we need to share the burden of getting applications right, rather than, in many respects, own completely the obligation to take an unacceptable application and make it acceptable. And that, that our previous approach essentially made the council, the planning authority, uh, own the responsibility uh, for getting the application right by a myriad of amendments. And of course, the third party interest in that space was that a number of communities and individuals have told us that constant amendments of planning applications and reconsultation uh, of the monet not only prolongs the agony in some cases for those people who are neighbours or concerned about development happening next to them, but it also makes it increasingly hard for them to understand with sometimes two or three reconsultations what it is they're being asked to, asked to comment along. So we're keeping it under review. We are trying to make the process uh, clear and, and be perfectly straightforward to the uh, uh, architects and, and advisors that, that, that help the vast majority of applicants uh, make an application and trying to, uh, to convey to them the importance of them helping their clients uh, to get the application right first time. Uh, because that we we believe in the long term that's got to be a, of benefit both to our citizens, our re our residents who are paying these agents, but also to the process, to the neighbours, uh, and indeed to productivity and efficiency in terms of the service. Thank you, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, just briefly, if I may, just just pick up on that that last point. I'm I'm, I'm pleased to hear that this is being reviewed and there is a pilot on that no amendments policy because I have been contacted um, on occasion by some people who are on the other side of the planning 
uh, divide to, to the people I normally hear from. I'm expressing some frustration that they've been they've had to resubmit applications where there were what to their mind were very minor things that they could have dealt with with an amendment, but they, they weren't allowed to. So anyway, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that that's that's a pilot and it's under review, and you'll be you'll be looking over that that policy and how it operates. Um, on on the broader point, um, I, this does pick up on what what Councillor Bradnam said, um, and I wouldn't doubt for a second, of course, that the staff in the planning department are, are, are working extremely hard, and I know they are under um, a lot of pressure, but I, I do have to say from my side as a ward member, um, and I think from the side of my parish councils, things aren't working as well as they could be. Um, I think parish councils feel that they see the same application sort of week after week after week on the weekly updates. One of my parish councils recently said that they thought that when the weekly update came in, they were really pleased. They thought it would be a great source of information. But now they find it rather depressing because they're just getting the same applications again and again and again. And new ones get added. And no one, uh, very few seem to get taken off the bottom. So the list gets longer and longer. And I must say, as a ward member, I notice that the number of applications in hand is going up and up and up every week. It, it, it's not really coming down. So something isn't working right. I understand the difficulties. Um, and I say I don't doubt for a second that the staff are not working very hard, but I do think something is not working, and it would be very good to hear um, a plan of action as to what the service is planning to do to start to clear these backlogs, because I think um, you know residents are suffering, particularly in the minor applications parish councils are noticing, and I think they would like a positive statement about what we're we're doing about it. And if I can just make one final point, Chair. Um, I was very interested in the data that Councillor Hawkins supplied on EOTs and other authorities. It would be great if I could be emailed to the committee because I don't think it was in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, did, did you wish to come back on that? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Hawkins, my apologies. Uh, that's, thank you very much, Chair. I'm sure you know, I, I will ask Stephen to come on um, and answer some of it. Um, yes, that uh, I'll take the last one first. Uh, no, harm, no problem. We can um, forward that to the um, to the committee. Um, just to say, uh, my ward villages are not seeing what yours are seeing, <laughs> Councillor um, Richard Williams. Um, but I take the point. Some of these applications have been in the system a while, potentially, because I think we started this new amendment. Um, on the 1st of July, so it's just kind of uh, come in. So anything that's submitted before that um, will still potentially have the, yes, you can make changes, but anything submitted after that is not. Um, and I'm sure Mr. Kelly can correct me if I'm wrong. But the, the, the thing is, what we've, the reason this has come in, obviously, you know, in addition, is I know for a fact that, and I've been told this by a couple of people or more, that when they've had applications go in, that, you know, they just, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll just throw it in, they'll tell us what we need if we need any more, <laughs> right? Putting the onus on our planners to do their work for them, and we're not getting paid for it. So there is a, you know, there is a practical reason, or that's an additional practical reason. Um, and the agents know, because <laughs> they were warned, they were written to, We've had agents forum meetings, and if anyone else is listening, uh, we reiterate that again, that it is working together to make the system work for all of us. Um, but yes, as, as, um, as we've heard, the process is under review, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, if, if we can get applicants, A, to... Um, you know, perhaps go through our pre-app, and I know we have issues with those, but that's the whole reason why we went through a revision. And yes, that's not working as well as we would like it to at the moment, but again, that's down to resource. But what one of the things we're doing, which has come up through the transformation project, is actually providing additional guidance on our website on how to make planning applications. There's already a couple of videos um, on the Greater Cambridge Planning website uh, that actually walks applicants through, says, you know, this is what you need and that's what you need. So we're going to be doing a lot more of that, improving the information we provide to applicants so they can get it right. So we can then process the application for them in the time 
plan or in the statutory period of time. Um, I've said enough that I think I can say I'll ask Mr. Kelly to um, yeah, fill in the blanks I've left. <laughs> Stephen, over to you. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and picking up on Councillor Williams' is, is point, um, we recognise that there is, in, in many respects, there, are, there, are, there is still a, a variation in the kind of monthly outputs from the, from the planning service. But if I refer uh, members to page 13, uh, to paragraph 13, one of the encouraging signs is from really a low point in the middle of the uh, lockdown pandemic, where we were looking at really um, only being able to make about 160, 180 decisions a, a month. At September 2021, so the last month that we um, uh, that saw uh, 406 decisions going out of the door, uh, and so we are starting to uh, make some constructive progress. The the, the, the key point around um, the variance uh, and and the graphs in many respects illustrate it is one of the key objectives of the transformation program is to is to um, dig down into the reasons behind uh, the variance. We know some of them. Uh, and certainly they relate to uh, levels of staffing uh, and indeed staff availability, as well as practical issues. For example, we didn't have any planning committees in uh, in May uh, and indeed we couldn't put site notices up if members will recall uh, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, for, for health reasons. Um, but we do feel that we're starting to um, at least uh, get a much richer understanding about the reasons for those variances. Uh, and, by, and, and by way of, of, of reassurance to Councillor Williams, the transformation uh, team uh, and our partners are taking a, a, a totally holistic end-to-end -end view about those barriers to both consistent but timely uh, decision-making as well as uh, um, uh, improved communications. The biggest issue we've got, and indeed it's, in, it, 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 it's reflected in some respects in, in uh, Councillor Williams's original question that has prompted this report, is that we are carrying a, a, a fairly substantial um, uh, load of live planning applications. And what that does uh, is uh, create an element of failure demand in people who uh, quite rightly are expecting to find out where their decision is, needing to contact the authority to chase up decisions uh, or indeed contact members to chase up on their behalf those decisions. So there is a program that we're working with the transformation team now on to remove uh, those long-standing applications that are essentially impeding the ability of frontline planning officers to deal promptly with the work in front of them uh, and to um, uh, take an approach of uh, essentially lifting some of that. Uh, it's not dead weight because it's live applications, but lifting some of that work out to make both case officers uh, caseloads a little bit more manageable, which will improve contact with uh, and their ability to communicate with our customers, but also to have a concerted uh, and clear program in place uh, to try and tackle it. The data that we've got suggests that, um, in fact, that backlog uh, or the uh, number of cases on hand has stayed fairly steady through the last 24-month period. Uh, and what that points to is notwithstanding that, in fact, officers have had to work incredibly hard to keep that, um, uh, that steady uh, state, it does suggest that it's not a simple matter of resource uh, 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 in terms of uh, overall staffing, although we are looking at that. In fact, we're part of a national project with the Planning Advisory Service, which is benchmarking authorities across the country to make sure that we can understand uh, how we fit in uh, not only in relation uh, to perhaps local councils, but actually more widely across the across the country through a national a national program. So there's a there's a pro the, the main issue that we're looking to tackle is how can we improve uh, case officers workloads uh, uh, by perhaps um, uh, separating out some of those older and long standing applications and and freeing them up to concentrate uh, on the uh, cases that they have coming through the door right now whilst at the same time clearing away effectively and efficiently uh, those perhaps long-standing cases where they're getting a lot, we're getting a lot of calls and you as members, I'm sure are getting a lot of comment. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Claire Daunton. Thank you. Um, I'd like us to um, talk a little bit about staffing. Um, on 
in paragraph 17 on page 29 of our agendas, um, the report refers to difficulties in recruitment. Um, so I've got two questions. One, um, are the difficulties greater now than they were, say, for example, last year? Um, and um, do we know why um, we, are, are there any particular reasons why it's difficult for us to recruit here in South Cambridge or in Greater Cambridge than it is in other parts of the country? Are we suffering more of a problem than, say, other rural areas or even other metropolitan areas? Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, superficially, no, seriously, it's expensive to live here. <laughs> we all know that. But generally, there is a shortage of planners. It's a nationwide problem. It's not just us. Um, even the um, private companies here are finding the same. So we're all trying to fish in the same limited pool. Um, as to specific issues, um, perhaps I'll ask Mr. Kelly um, to um, answer that part of the question. But we definitely need some more investment nationally in planners. Thank you. Stephen. Thank you. Um, I think there's two, there's two broad issues, and it's interesting. I've been, um, I'm in Southwark at this moment in time, uh, where... Uh, the developer that, that um, uh, I was talking to earlier on was saying that they've spent very large sums of money with the local authority uh, and they can't get any planners uh, in response to it. Uh, and, and so it, it, what we're looking at is a national problem, particularly for uh, experienced uh, staff. Now, it's fair to say that one of the effects of, of lockdown last year was that a lot of people, and it wasn't just in planning, across all sectors, I think, took a view about staying put. Uh, and um, we had very, very low staff turnover uh, in the previous 12 months. But with the advent of greater mobility and increased confidence, particularly in the kind of development market, um, we've, we've noticed uh, a number of people, a number of our staff starting to move on or looking at exploring new opportunities. And that's not just um, a reflection of uh, the, the scarcity. Uh, there are elements to working in Greater Cambridge that are challenging. Um, we have a, uh, a highly scrutinised um, uh, planning environment in, in this area, and that, and that does carry with it pressures on our staff uh, in terms of uh, their, um, uh, their, their experience uh, of working for us. But more particularly, um, it also means that we need to double down on our efforts, not only in terms of recruitment, uh, but uh, in retention. And so for the next uh, financial year, we are looking to invest further in creating um, uh, and taking advantage of the Royal Town Planning Institute apprenticeships so that we can uh, bring pathways for people to join the planning service and hopefully support them so that they stay with us. But also importantly, uh, to try and put in place measures that allow us to retain our staff uh, for longer or indeed to, to retain them as part of a kind of managed process of, of um, uh, progression, uh, recognising that you know, people will at all, way, all times with a market as lively as this uh, seek to both join us to gain the fantastic experience that you can get uh, with, with the kind of work and projects we've got, uh, but also uh, become incredibly valuable and incredibly um, attractive to all of our competitors, not just planning authorities, uh, but also the planning consultancies. The projects in Greater Cambridge are some of the best in the country, uh, and our team who work on them are highly prized um, uh, hires for both public and private sector companies. So we, we know that we've, we've still got to work harder on that. It is not just an issue of pay, um, uh, although that's clearly uh, a, a factor that the public sector struggles with, but it's about trying to create the very best experience and help our planners to really enjoy being here, um, which some days can be quite hard. And we've talked about workloads and, and so on. So there's a so our response to this national challenge needs to be comprehensive, but it needs to focus not only on recruitment uh, and talent development, but also retention. And we're looking to do that um, in our proposals for the next year. Thank you very much indeed. Very comprehensive response. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Yeah, I think 
lot of what is going to say be dealt with. I mean, certainly a lot of the applications um, uh, where we have delays are actually not our fault at all. It's down to the applicant, often his agent, and sorting it out between themselves. And often they get stuck because the, 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 the applicant or his agent don't actually provide the information. That's not to say the applicant can be demented, it's they just don't produce the information in a timely way. So it's actually, to some extent, not me for a part of the talk at all. Um, uh, uh, I, I just mentioned that Stephen mentioned, which is quite right, that the backlog of cases. A lot of cases, the, the application is almost there. It's 95% of the way there. And just one additional little bit of the jigsaw is needed to actually uh, determine it. Uh, and the other point I was going to make, I think, was that um, the, uh, we want to be careful we don't replace the historical backlog with a backlog that's de developing because of the extension of time. So we could easily be in a position of three years' time with a new backlog, which is exactly the same as the one we've got at the moment. Um, I mean, that is, to some extent, possibly demonstrated the figures, because I know that the, the average of the EOTs has increased from 39% of a minor application in September 2019, almost doubled to 76% in recent months. So we could actually be in a position of all these EOTs bunching up, in fact, at a, at a further stage in the process. Um, and I think the other thing I was going to make with COVID, we, we could well be in a position with growth starting to, to sort of resume again of getting more applications in the next year or two, and perhaps we've experienced it even even though they've still done very well. So, there will, so I'm just wondering whether we are building into our, um, our planning strategy, if you like, an anticipated increase in the number of planning applications in the, in the next year, couple of years. So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Um, thank you, Chairman. We recognise... Um, I think Mr. Kelly has spoken um, about this, the fact that you know, we are at this point trying to um, deal with what was a historic backlog. Um, and one of that is to bring in additional resource to enable us clear that so that our officers can focus on the new cases that come in and put those through. Um, we did have, if you might recall, a backlog in the validation process and of course, it's like anything else, you've got this huge amount of traffic sitting there waiting, and then you release it, and it goes on to the next stage, <laughs> uh, which is what has happened. Um, but now, you know, we're going to try and get that off so that um, officers have something that they can deal with. Um, so hopefully that kind of <laughs> um, helps answer uh, part of the question. Can you remember what the second one was? The second point that you made? Hopefully, once we've, you know, when we've been able to get rid of this historic one, we can work in a more uh, level way, <laughs> so to speak. And it, it's not surprising we've had an increase in extensions of time for the minors, particularly because we've had that backlog, which has then pushed onto the case officers uh, to deal with. Uh, but I'm expecting that, yes, um, as COVID recedes, there will be more applications. We are expecting more. There will be more. There already is more than what we had before. Um, so this is a growing area. It's a dynamic area. And it's an area that's going to be seeing a lot more, um, a lot more uh, growth. So I guess hopefully with the transformation project coming to, you know, helping us to um, streamline things, we should be able to then determine, you know, the um, the level of resource that we need, and obviously then bring that in. But with a streamlined process, I would imagine that we should be able to uh, deal with some of these issues going forward. Uh, Mr. Kelly, would you like to add some more to that? Steve. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it won't surprise, I, I mean, I'm not about to rush down to William Hill and put some money on the fact that uh, application numbers are going to increase. Uh, what we did notice uh, in the uh, latter part of, of last year 
was um, a, a bit of a bounce really in respect of we had quite a large increase in the number of applications. Uh, it's less predictable at this moment in time. So looking towards uh, this autumn, perhaps some of the trends that we've seen over the last five or six years in terms of patterns of applications per month uh, are not tracking exactly this, this year as perhaps they were um, based upon historical patterns. We're obviously, um, we've done quite a lot of work. Stephen Windsor, I have to pay credit to him, has done a huge amount of work trying to look at uh, can we have an algorithm that will try and predict uh, what we think is going to happen based upon past performance? Of course, the difficulty is, is that COVID uh, is not really uh, an entirely uh, known entity in terms of the effect it's having on the development market. There are a whole series of externalised impacts, even down to things like the availability of materials and indeed costs of construction, which are putting off uh, as much as there is a stimulus in terms of the market for applications are putting off people implementing those permissions uh, and therefore doing things like discharging uh, conditions. In fact, the largest almost category of applications that we have is around the discharge of conditions. So um, we have developed quite a, 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 a sophisticated um, a model that tries to predict what we think should be happening each month. Uh, and then what we will have to do, the reality is, is what we'll have to do is to track those assumptions against realities uh, as we go through the winter and start to head out into uh, 2022. But um, we are, in so far as we can, uh, doing that in order that we can try and match the resource that we need uh, to the patterns uh, as, as they emerge. Uh, and I'd be the first to recognise uh, that requires a lot of work to get to the point where we can do that. Um, we have spent a lot of effort uh, over the last uh, three and four months, especially trying to um, build something that allows us to do that more effectively, precisely so that we can safeguard our staff from uh, uh, peaks of, of, of work, but also so that we can predict the resource requirements going forwards and indeed the income and costs um, that we might need to balance in order to achieve, uh, achieve a proper response. Thank you. Councillor Judith Rippert. This is more of a comment um, rather than a question. I hope that's okay. Um, I find the list that we get on a weekly basis really useful, just as a tracker for me, just so I've got them, you know, the applications in hand in mind. And obviously, I'm very aware that as a local member, I can always talk to somebody and discuss and, you know, try and um, apply a bit of friendly pressure if need be um, and I just want to comment that one person actually got back to me to say how quickly she'd had a response on her householder application and to tell her how to improve it and it wasn't you know good enough um, it wouldn't you know get approved and she I just want to pass on that praise because there are examples where um, people have said, oh, it was really good. I got, within a few weeks, um, the information I needed so I could go back to the architect, etc., and rejig the application and, and put it back, you know, put it back in. I know that she should have probably gone for a pre-app first, mm -hmm. but um, at least that was, I felt, really positive um, comments. So they do exist and... I do also want you to know as a planning service that, you know, I think that's a really positive step in the right direction. And thank you. Thank you, Judith. Yeah. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, just to say a very quick thank you for that. We do like to hear such comments and I would encourage them to, <laughs> to send that comment in so we can be able to say, yeah, we do do something positive. We do. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Martin Carr. Um, it's really a question on the impact of the fact that we have parish councils to deal with and dealing with planning applications. Uh, you, you, Great Planning Service has the uh, Great Cambridge Planning Service has the ability to compare applications within the city where there aren't parish councils to the areas outside. Uh, and I would be interested to know. I mean, we've taken it recently. We've taken an interest in improving the relationship with parish councils, and we've had in particular to deal with more applica applications where the parish is objected in, in our planning service. 
how does this have an impact? What sort of impact is it? Is it easier within the city than outside because of that extra level of consultation? Do we have more delays because of that? Uh, because of the, the greater level of intent, the, the more intense interest in the applications coming from a, a structure which is there to comment on, on, on the applications, which obviously is created. Uh, yeah, there's great, greater political interest in it, perhaps you should say. Uh, and I just wonder your comments on that, whether that has, has had an effect and whether it does have an effect. Councillor Hawkins, would you like to keep that one off? Uh, I'll leave that to Mr Kelly. <laughs> Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, what I would say is I don't think we have at this moment in time, empirical evidence to, t to take a, a, a fully informed view. I suppose anecdotally, um, it's probably fair to say I, I spend um, more of my time managing those relationships uh, with parishes simply because there aren't parishes in the, in the, in the city. So from a South Cam's perspective, uh, it obviously takes an element, uh, it's a layer of, of, of local government, an important one, uh, and quite understandably, we're looking to try and engage with and support parishes. Uh, and they have a number of questions uh, and challenges to, to our planning process. There is a slightly different process in the city in that although they, they don't have parish councils, they have residence associations, uh, and the protocols in the city uh, provide for a, um, a review mechanism uh, called a development control forum, which uh, at which any body uh, uh, securing a certain number of signatures uh, can seek a, um, a forum meeting in which uh, developments are um, reviewed. Now, it's fair to say uh, there are uh, fewer forums uh, than parish council meetings and, and, and so on, but um, uh, there is it. I'm slightly comparing apples apples with pears. As we go forwards, uh, and we've got a time recording system in which um, we're trying to increasingly seek to understand exactly what our officers are spending uh, their time on, I suspect we might be able to uh, refine it uh, to understand the amount of extra time spent doing work uh, related to supporting our parishes. Uh, and um, uh, But at this moment in time, we don't, we, don't, we don't have that information that would allow me to make a, an informed view uh, that that uh, I would suggest uh, people could rely upon, but it is it is a it is a very distinct difference, uh, and it's something that we will be looking further at as as you know we seek to make the very best use of of, of our time, but also importantly, through the shared services agreement, uh, each of the authorities seeks to understand what it's spending its money on. Thank you very much. And. Our final speaker is Councillor Jeff Barbie. Thank you, Chair. Um, and it's sort of going to pay some tribute to our former um, Chair of the Council, um, Douglas Lacey, and his long-running campaign to uh, get um, standard deviations built into uh, data on, uh, well, usually it was about uh, time to answer the phone. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that occurred to me in relation to this is that, and um, Stephen Kelly has talked about the sort of long case list that a lot of the officers have on their desk and one can imagine within there um, and because of that there are some real shockers in terms of the time it takes to get back to some of our residents um, in just just in terms of courtesy of replying to an email and and I expect if we had a metric that said you know what was the average time to respond to an email it, 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 it would perhaps be quite acceptable but within there there would be some cases that are really unacceptable and I I worry that those cases um, do a kind of disproportionate uh, damage to our um, standing with our residents. And, and I wondered whether there's some way within the IDOC system to sort of track those and maybe actually take those away from the, the skilled officers and just give them to a, you know, somebody whose job it is to, to explain why the officer is under pressure and, you know, haven't forgotten you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, I remember in my career, I've dealt a lot with um, patent agents, and I, I, it was just so nice that you could absolutely rely on them, never to miss a date to respond to the examiner, et cetera, because they had systems in place to make sure that could never happen. Um, and I just wondered if we could do something there. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, I will defer this to Mr Kerry. 
Stephen. Thank you. Um, we are looking actually, uh, because I think that's a very important point. Um, some applications get determined in 40 days, some applications in 300 for a range of reasons, and it has a very profound effect on, on um, the average. What um, we are exploring is whether or not we can, we can perhaps capture uh, the upper and lower quartiles or the extremes through presenting the information slightly differently rather than it just presenting an average. Uh, because I think it's far more meaningful to understand the, the longest and shortest time periods, but actually uh, look at the, the, the kind of upper and lower quartiles and the averages that that creates. So um, within the, we've got a, a, a bit of a project going on at the moment in the shared planning service around what are our, what are the best performance metrics? I don't think, as I said earlier on, the government's performance metrics are the best measure of how we're doing. Uh, and um, how can we perhaps start to, uh, as we look at our processes, um, build those uh, more reflective metrics into the performance management regime and the way that we work with our, our, our teams and our, and our staff? We have no more speakers. We are asked to, uh, to note the contents of this report. Perhaps I could just draw your attention to the fact that we, we uh, look forward to a greater level pro promotion perhaps for the customer portal. Um, we'd like to see the no amendment highlighted and we look forward to receiving the uh, data of other councils in due course. Um, but with that, can I thank you uh, for your contribution, Councillor Hawkins and Stephen, thank you very much and I hope you manage to get out of there before they lock the doors. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I ought to welcome Councillor John Williams, who joined us part way through that item. Thank you for joining, John. You're very welcome. And it's extremely timely, as we are now about to move on to the investment strategy, uh, which is uh, set out in your paper as agenda item eight. And perhaps I might therefore ask you to introduce it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, as you know, um, I think I promised at a full council meeting some time ago now that we would be reviewing and updating the um, investment strategy uh, policy uh, to take account of uh, not only the changes in the Public Works Loan Board uh, rules, which if we are to continue to low, uh, borrow money from the Public Works Loan Board, we will need no longer to um, be able to invest in um, and borrow money from them for, for, uh, for yield, uh, for commercial yield. And um, obviously we wish to continue to borrow money from the Public Works Loan Board. Um, so we are no longer continuing with what we've called Stream 1, which is the um, investment in uh, commercial uh, properties purely for yield or for income. Um, as a result of that, we've had a review of, um, of stream two and three, and you'll see from the report that we have reorganized um, and recategorized the uh, investment uh, portfolio into service um, uh, investments, which are basically um, our own companies uh, like Herman Street where we loan um, money um, and then um, for them to be able to um, fulfill our uh, wish to see houses that are affordable to live in for, the, for everybody across um, every type of house and Herman Street fulfills a very important role in providing very high quality um, open market rented housing. The, um, the second stream, commercial investments. Uh, we will continue with commercial investments, but they are for basically to generate economic growth and to um, strengthen the current local economy. And then we have our, our third stream, which is our partnerships, and that's not really touched by this, but there are some changes. So um, it's not just about... Um, 
abiding by the new uh, Public Works Loan Board rules and say we have taken the opportunity to have a complete review of our investment strategy. Um, investment strategy accounts for something like a quarter of our income at the moment, so it's very important to us. And um, I think Peter is going to do a bit of a presentation on, on this, so I'll hand over to Peter now. Thank you. Peter, welcome. Hello. Oh, it's all right. I was looking up there. Oh, so, um, yeah, just just a couple of slides, just to give a bit of context to some of the figures. So, the first one is looking at the investment income levels that we've achieved. Uh, if you press the next button, um, it's basically looking at the investment income levels that we've achieved since 2014-15, which was when Ernie Street came into existence. So you'll see, obviously, in the first year, uh, that little that little blue bar is at thirty thousand, and up until this year, the estimate for this year is about five point four million. So you can see how the investment strategy and the income related to it has grown significantly over the intervening periods. And if it's not clear, the, yeah, so the blue area relates to Ernie Street, the orange to the commercial. Reds, and those are primarily the stream one investments, and there's a little grey bit at the end that relates to the ice rink. So, um, it, it's as a picture, it shows how, how important now the, the income streams from our investments are to the authority. Very helpful, thank you. So, if we move on to the next slide, um, this is just uh, showing our former stream one investments and the amount that they cost. Um, with 270 Science Park, there's, a, there's an element of 4.2 million in there for refurbishment. So the purchase for price is a little over 8 million. And then since uh, purchase, we've been refurbishing the property. So we've spent a little over 47 million on those properties in the intervening period. And then the next slide um, is just looking at the yield. So the first slide looks at the gross yield. So this is assuming that all of the rent is paid and all of the areas are occupied. So you'll see it's uh, around about six and just over for, for the four properties there that we're showing. Uh, 270 Science Park is deliberately omitted from this slide because obviously we weren't anticipating uh, letting that out at this stage. And then the, the final slide um, looks at the um, yield if we take into account voids and non-payment. So for the Vitram building, for example, there's about a third of that property is currently void. So the, the, if you take that, that out, you can see that the, um, the yield is somewhat lower. And at Colm, we've, we've had some difficulty recovering rent due because of the pandemic and the current, the current arrangements that we can't serve notice on them. So, um, so you'll see that uh, both the, the yield in those two areas is affected quite significantly. <clears throat> so that's just a bit of additional context. Um, as John said, um, the most significant element of the change is in relation to the PWLB consultation that came out last year. Um, the government had for some time been unhappy with the level of, um, of investment that local authorities had made in property primarily for yield. Um, so they, they instigated a consultation in the response uh, that came back on the 26th of November last year, so nearly a year ago, was that um, any council that wished to borrow from the PWLB for any reason, and it's quite possible that we might want to borrow from the PWLB, particularly for housing purposes, um, they're not able to invest in property that is primarily for yield, even if we don't need to borrow for that purchase. So if we used our own cash, we still cannot do that if we wish to borrow from the PWLB. Um, the difficulty in the intervening period has been getting clarity around quite what this all means. And I think it's probably fair to say, back in November last year, the clarity was pretty much non-existent. I think we've now got to a stage where we have a, quite a bit more clarity, though not complete clarity. So, um, the strategy as it stands uh, and is, is proposed now is that we don't invest in Stream 1 for the reasons just outlined. Um, there are one or two other 
amendments such as the introduction of a responsible investment policy uh, and one or two other things that we've got updated there. Um, there is some checking and some uh, figure work still to be finalised, um, but we thought it was worth bringing this to this committee at an early stage to get comments and views of the committee on the strategy and the general direction of it. So, pass it over to members. That's very much. It's okay. <coughs> yeah, just just, be, just before we do, can I just comment, make one minor comment? There is a little inconsistency in the title of Adele Britton on the uh, front sheet, she's described as the Head of Economic Development and, Co and Commercial Investment, whereas on the, um, on the uh, structure on page 75, she's described as the Head of Economic Development and Investment. Perhaps at some point we could get those. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Just, get, just get them um, stabilised. Um, members, I think I saw... Peter Fain's hand go first. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I may have misunderstood some part of the, the, the presentation there. Um, the first thing was in relation to slide one. Um, I was a little confused by the units being used. Um, maybe just my eyesight. Oh, sorry, that's... Uh, yes. Yeah. Thousands. Uh, yes, I assume so. Um, uh, but I was also a little confused as to where Ermine Street now comes, which stream is that in? Um, I thought I'd got that wrong, but I have probably got it wrong. How are we treating that? And, um, no, that, that'll, that'll, that'll do. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll be treating that as a service investment yeah. on the basis that it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the British Council. Okay. Well, just to, to follow up, if I understood correctly, if we borrow from the Public Works Loan Board at all, we can't invest for yield at all, even our own cash. Is, is that right, or have I misunderstood? So, the, the crux of the matter is um, if it's primarily for yield. Uh, if there is a yield that's a byproduct or part of, the, of a wider scheme, so for regeneration, for example, um, if there is some yield as part of that, that is fine. Um, and housing is another is another thing that the PWLB are quite comfortable with if it's for a housing purpose. So there's a there's a number of things they're quite happy with. I think the problem is none of this has actually really been tested so far. So there's still a grey area. Thank you. Right. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Through you, I, I wondered um, in relation to these two main chunks of investment. Um, obviously, Ermine Street has been um, established as a an entity in its own right. So, in that case, we can be certain that we can measure the money that's gone into it and measure the money that is coming out in terms of investment return. But um, can we can we compare it, these two as apples with apples? And you know would we strictly not have to look at the um, the opportunity cost of any investment officer time and the cost of due diligence, et cetera, that might have gone into generating the commercial property return? And, and you know, has that been done in terms of um, the, the uh, bottom line figures that you presented? Councillor Williams, did, did you want to respond to that or...? Um, if, I if I understand Councillor Harvey right, I mean, that is something that is done when we consider, um, at the report stage, when we consider um, purchasing that particular property. Um, that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure understanding what Councillor Harvey is, is getting at, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Harvey, please. Um, well, I suppose what the point is that um, have, if, if, if we were to, well, it looks as though we're not going to do any more of this, but if we were going to do it as a continuing um, way of generating revenue um, 
from investments, um, then obviously we would have to um, deduct from the return that we get from those investments the ongoing cost of um, officer time in setting up those investments. And I just wondered if that's included in the figures or not. Uh, yes, well, it is. Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, Mr. Maddock pointed out that on the question about where does service investment go, you, you, you seem to imply that service investment, through you, Chair, to Mr. Maddock, that service investment went into a particular stream, but I didn't gather which stream that was. Uh, and the second one was um, just a, a small point um, on page 77. Uh, we've got, I, mean, I have to say, the amount of amendment in this report is actually quite reassuring. It suggests that people are working very hard to make sure it says what it should do. Uh, so I'm quite encouraged by that. But just a um, little typo slipped in on page 77. Appendix 4, commercial regeneration. Um, there's a missing E in the title there, just, you know, proofreading thing. Um, and going on from that, I wanted to understand, um, we're talking about scope of investment, and this is now... Um, I'm not quite sure what stream it is because stream two has been crossed out on page 77. And so I'm looking at the bottom of page 77 and going over the pages to, this is basically a description of the scope of investment. <coughs> Excuse me. And on page 79, we've got bullet C where it talks about projects where the intention is to inject further investment beyond the initial purchase price. This could be through refurbishing or repurposing the acquired asset. For example, purchasing an office building with the intention of converting it, say, into residential or other uses for yield. And I think, if I've understood the amendment correctly, this is an acceptable purpose for a stream, but I'm not quite sure which stream it is. However, my concern is that I am deeply concerned that any um, thoughts about converting office buildings into residential purposes, um, there's the element of the fact that that might be allowable, I think, for yield. And so perhaps would come under the OK category for Public Works Loan Board. But what I'm really worried about is the principle of converting office buildings into residential developments, unless they're eminently suitable to be converted in that way. So I'm, I'm just trying to work out what this means, you know? Perhaps somebody could clarify. Thank you. So um, as regards the stream system, we've abandoned that completely now. Because obviously stream one was, um, was the um, investments primarily for yield. Stream two, um, was those where that we were going to refurbish something like 270 Science Park and then Stream 3 was the um, investment partnership. So that, we thought, well, as Stream 1 is gone, it's quite difficult to then call them 1, 2 and 3 and call it something else. We've abandoned that entirely and gone to the idea of a service-related investment, a commercial and regeneration type investment, and then the investment partnerships. So we're splitting it up rather differently than we did before. So we've still got three types, but they're, they're not called streams anymore. Um, the comment on, uh, that, that, that's just an example. It's not something that we would necessarily do. Uh, and it's just trying to demonstrate that um, if, somewhere, if somewhere in the country there was a property that we were going to convert to be residential, that would be acceptable to the PWLB as, a, as something that they could lend for. But whether we would do it or not would obviously be up to up to the particular scheme and, and whether it was uh, sensible or reasonable. Councillor Bradman, do you want to come back on that? Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Maddock. So 
I'm assuming that that's that's okay as far as the Public Works Loan Board is concerned because in the in that it provides it's providing hope housing. Yeah, okay, I'm with you. Thank you. I have to say I, I share that concern of you know, converting offices into residential. Um, when they were constructed, of course, they were constructed as offices um, and have, have totally different requirements for re than residential. Um, so that particular area is one that I think we ought to look at very carefully um, and whether it should be included. Quite happy to remove that example if members so wish. Yeah. We'll see when we come to the end of it. Councillor Van der Weyen. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask a question of clarification before getting on to the substantive comments, which is largely along the same lines as before. Um, my understanding um, uh, about the Public Works, Public Works Loan Board with restrictions is that um, uh, the, the location and, and, and the purpose is quite important rather than just sort of the overall, the, whether it's a commercial investment um, uh, with, with a sort of high yield. So, um, for example, so some of these... Um, sites on the science park obviously that our main motivation when we made those investments was was yield but there might be other advantages that they're, they're, they're within the um, uh, within the district um, they're converting them in one case obviously to provide a different sort of business accommodation so um, could those sorts of things still be justified so could some of those investments I mean it's, it's, a theory, it's a hypothetical question but could some of those investments be have been justified under the new rules do you think or even those ones are they a little bit too borderline to take a risk with I think possibly um, I mean um, quite clearly um, if, if there was an investment outside the district then there would be a presumption from the PWLB that that was not acceptable if it's within the district, then it's quite possible you could run an argument around employment, possibly again regeneration and repurposing, and those would be acceptable. Um, so I, I think it would depend on the degrees of regeneration and repurposing that you're doing, but yeah, quite possibly you could build a case, yeah, I would agree. Okay. Um, I, I do want to make a, then a comment, a more general comment, um, which is that the, the, what are the questions that the investment strategy was dealing with um, originally is but when we're making some investments, there, there's, a, there's a balance between the yield that you get back and, and some, some other public policy uh, objectives. Um, uh, with some, like tweaking the layout of an office, the public policy objectives are relatively limited, and so therefore it's important to have a good yield. But with others, you might be getting more sort of social benefit and so you can accept a, a low yield and that, that's what was, we were trying to achieve with the stream one stream two differentiation where stream one there was a minimum of five percent yield with stream two we would accept a lower yield if we if we were getting some some other other benefits and and, and that was quite so sort of, that was a, a fundamental part of the um of the strategy um so obviously for, for the for the reasons that you've been describing um, we we can't uh, have that it, it sort of set out like that um so the, the, this solution the, the the proposal is to Effectively, amalgamate anything that's um, in investment into the commercial regeneration pot. Um, but what we, I think, risk losing is is, is the ability to to uh, think about that balance between yield and public benefit. Um, and uh, now, for example, uh, I, I think there's a requirement for all of the commercial regeneration investments to have five percent. Um, uh, yields, whereas obviously we were, we were it, it, I'd be grateful if you could clarify that if I've misunderstood. Whereas previously we, we were, would have accepted a slightly lower yield if we were getting more more, more benefits. So so um, does that mean that we're going to be uh, possibly making looking at fewer opportunities to, to make investments which do have a, a, a wider benefit? Um, and then and then if we're not building the that 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 yield benefit balance into the strategy, then, we, then we've got to count, take into account the yield into our assessments of, of, of each individual inv investment. And so the, the um, table for, for doing making a, um, uh, uh, the criteria matrix on page 89, for example, that doesn't include yield in it. Um, so I, I'd, I'd be concerned that, that uh, then you're, we're effectively saying everything has to have 5% yield in order to be considered at all, um, which, which might mean we do miss out on some, some 
um, opportunities that, that do benefit the council financially, but also um, have that that, that bigger benefit, that wider wider benefit. Um, I, I, so um, obviously, this is my first reading through this, first discussion about it. So I, I, I might have misunderstood some some of the sort of nuances and subtleties in, in, in how this is set out. But this, this is my concern that, that we're not we're not um, uh, we've we've lost the 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 structure around that balance between um, financial yield and other benefits. I'm going to ask Councillor Williams if he'd like to come in on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you look at um, uh, paragraph um, 7.31, um, and it's very helpful that uh, we've shown the changes in red, but if you see in paragraph 7.31, regarding stream one, which is the old um, stream for purely commercial, then that obviously was 5%. Um, but then if you look at paragraph uh, 7.3.2, you'll also see that stream 2 investments, uh, which I believe are the investments that um, Councillor Van der Weer is, is, is talking about, that was also 5%. Um, and what we're proposing is that the current, the, the new service investment stream, which is, I say, loans to um, to our own um, companies um, or loans to things that, like the ice ring, that produce an amenity for the council, we are looking at 2.5%. And that's on table uh, 8.45. Thank you. Councillor Van der Weyen. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a wider point about how we, how we analyse the balance uh, in, in, the, in the new strategy that, that I think is interesting. But on the, on the percentage, um, that, that, the, the, the way that this, this is presented implies that Stream 2 did have 5% requ yield requirement. Um, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that when we adopted the strategy in the first place two years ago, it, it wasn't that percentage. I don't know what's happened in the meantime. Um, uh, that, that, anyway, that, that's not my recollection. I mean, uh, I, I, is there some way of, of checking that, the facts on that would be useful. What would, the, the, is the previous strategy published somewhere sort of as, it, as a standalone document? Is there an existing strategy? Yeah, yeah, so the, the existing strategy the existing strategy, I think, came to the October 19 cabinet, so you could probably see the existing strategy there, but I can certainly check that point out, uh, Councillor Van der Weyen, I think. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll check that out and so just make sure that is in fact the case. I'm sure you can check back on the minutes. Oops, Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've just got a couple of short points. Um, one is just to ask for a bit of clarification around something on page 59 of our agenda pack, which is paragraph 3.2. Um, the contingency allocation has gone up from 75,000 to 250,000. That, that jumped out at me. So I was wondering if we could have a little bit more explanation as to why that's, that's gone up, whether it, it's because of um, there's an expectation of more volatility or, or whether there's some other reason. So I'd be grateful for a some clarification for that. The second point, really, it's a question for Mr. Maddox, and it's just, just, just his slides, um, the, the second and the third slides. Um, I, I'm assuming that the yield on your last slide is, is, is okay, because it was over 5%. Um, I was just wondering if those figures were the, 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 the final, the, the, actually, yeah, the, the final slide where you talked about the yields with voids. I, I'm assuming that's, that, that's okay, that's within what, what you expected. I was wondering if it's good, bad, or indifferent, really. Um, and the Victor building, just a quick question on that. Do, do you expect the, um, the void level there to fall? I think you said it was a third at the moment. Yeah, so, um, um, with regard to the first question, so that the 75,000 we refer to there was a general contingency we had within the budget. So it wasn't specific to the investment strategy. I 
and we felt that was a bit low, but uh, it was increased to 250. So that's a, basically a general fund, general contingency. Um, so as regards the veteran building, yeah, I think about yeah, I think it's about a third that is currently unoccupied. Um, so obviously um, we would look to to let that as as quickly as we possibly can. I think it's fair to say because of the pandemic, um, we struggled a bit. Um, but um, you know we're trying to engage with people at the moment. We haven't got a tenant that's interested, so there is obviously a concern there um, regarding letting that part of the building and that's obviously something we need to we need to push ahead with as soon as we possibly can. Could I, sorry, could I just come back on the middle point? But but just assuming on that on that average yield then of five point three percent, that that's within what you expect or I assume that's um yes, I'm just about it's just it's not as good as we would like because obviously of the voids, but yeah it's about it's just about what we would would expect because uh, say on the previous slide you see that both of those were originally expected at eighty six. Yes. Yeah. No. That's like, that, that was my question because I mean okay. I, I worked that out as about eighty-seven percent of what the, the figure on the, the previous. Oh, I see that. Yeah. But that's within. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's within acceptable parameters, but obviously not ideal given what we know we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Thank you. Just a point of clarification. Looking at the documents, fairly obvious that the. You know, we're encouraged to invest money in a much wider range of facilities. And to some extent, what we've done in the past, which is fine, we've looked at commercial investment where we're buying existing office buildings or science parks and putting our money there and, and getting the yield. It looks to me as if we're encouraging local authorities like this to take a very active, not passport, an active role in actually developing infrastructure in their areas. Now, that carries risks, but it also carries opportunities. I mean, for instance, the way of furthering our green agenda, we may, and this requires clarification, we may, for instance, obvious group of parties wish to invest in a, uh, in a solar farm, in fact, a new solar farm, or in a power station generating electricity from renewable sources, uh, in the sense of actually going into a partnership with a developer to achieve that. I mean, just looking at one on, on page 77, which says a key outcome of property investment will be the generation of economic growth from providing facilities and infrastructure. This includes the delivery of environmental benefits to the area. I mean, this is enormously wide. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so it, it does seem to, as I say, open up a whole range of uh, possibilities which we haven't in the past thought or, or able to consider. Just wondering what you know, what your comment was on that. Um, I, I think one thing that was really quite helpful from the latest PWLB guidance was that they were pretty clear that green investments uh, were okay because of the wider benefit that there was from it. Um, and again, um, it was quite interesting because uh, I had actually posed a couple of questions to the PWLB. Um, about six or seven months ago, trying to assess what sort of things fell within scope. And it, it was quite helpful that they came back and clarified that, you know, if it was a green type investment within the district, they were quite happy about that. But if we were trying to invest in something of a green nature outside the district, then that was obviously likely to fall foul of the, of the rules. So I think, you know, that there are some quite wide things that would be allowed under the new regimes um, under the new regime so um, things like this do look like a real go in relation to the PWLB as long as it's something that's within the district I think. Councillor Martin Carr. Councillor Cat got done selling my time down one of the elements I was going to ask but another one that I'm interested in is, is how you deal with um, defining uh, how you deal with existing commercial investments that you made, such as Science Park, and also within Urban Street, where you've invested in houses outside the district, which presumably would not be acceptable now if you were trying to invest. It would have to be within the district. You'll come to a period in the future when these need management, where they need upgrading, where they need to spend money. Uh, will you be then hindered in borrowing money to, to maintain the 
the question of commercial investment we've already got. How you deal with that? How will you deal with that? Um, uh, I feel it's, it's unclear to me what the position would be. Would you have to sell the investments? What would you do? So, again, um, in the consultation, they made it clear that any investments that we've made prior to the 26th of November, they would still be prepared to refinance any loans or support loans um, with PWLB borrowing because it was obviously prior to the, when the rules came in. So they made it clear it's not retrospective, it's only from the 26th onwards. Councillor Claire de Wanton. Um, on page 76, there's a map of the um, area, the investment target area. Um, and I, I wonder, and at the bottom, um, the sentence says, in the south of the district, the commuting area could include a number of districts outside the county. Could, could that word could be should include a number of districts outside the county? Because people are... Um, the travel to work area is much broader than this red line. I mean, what, what are the restrictions on including a broader, wider area? Um, I've, got, I've got a second question. After my first. So, um, I think I just had a slight qu question in my own mind as to whether that would be acceptable or not. And I, what I am actually going to try and get a bit more clarity on that. So you, it's quite possible that we should put should. See what I mean? I'd just quite like to get a little bit more clarity on that, but I'll obviously have to do that pretty quick. Could I ask my second question? Um, on, and that's to do with the, um, it goes back to um, Councillor Chamberlain's earlier remark concerning the type of, of the role for Adele Gritton. Um, you talk about the investment team and um, working with other parties. So I, I just want to understand a little bit more about the balance between the investment team in-house, which I assume includes um, it, yourself and um, uh, and Adele, and then other um, advisors from outside. And, and how does that work? What What is the investment team? So, so the investment team, um, is, 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 as it says, is headed by Adele. That sits uh, under Anne Ainsworth now. So that's in a different director, so that doesn't sit within my area now. Um, uh, and that team um, includes uh, colleagues that were formerly in the investment team. So we've got a number of colleagues that reported to the former head of that team, David Oosby. So they are now within Adele's team. So um, that team comprises all of the people that were, that were working on this uh, prior to it, the transfer. And we um, we have external consultants such as um, Carter Jones who assist with the management, so they manage those contacts as well. So all of that is run within the investment team, and obviously myself uh, and other colleagues work very closely with them. And indeed, myself uh, and Peter Campbell and others within the council were um, assisting and uh, creating this strategy. So there's a number of officers that have been involved in, in this. Sorry, if I could just. Uh, just to understand then, so that when there's a change, you're able to be flexible, the team is able to be flexible when there's a change in the strategy, um, as there must be at the moment with the change in the Public Works Loan Board. Yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered, um, in some sense, in a sort of public sector equivalent, uh, well, in, in this kind of field of operation, um, similar to um, an investment bank, I suppose. And, and if we were an investment bank, um, our shareholders would be asking us if we've yet signed up to the principles of disclosure covered by the, or suggested by the Task Force on Climate Change Related Financial Disclosure. Um, and, and indeed, I think Mark Carney uh, said last year sometime that the time has come to make this mandatory for particularly public quoted companies under, under the regulatory umbrella. And I know it kind of doesn't so obviously apply to us, but when you think about the way that climate change and the pace of it is picking up, 
it would be foolish actually not to be continually monitoring that. I mean, if for example, uh, although we're not investing in, for example, obvious uh, assets that could become stranded like, um, you know, oil companies, that kind of thing, actually, you know, it could affect the way that we um, acquire property through Ermine Street. I mean, you know, you could imagine that uh, were we considering that, we might decide not to buy um, houses um, on, on floodplains, for example. So um, I just wonder whether we should actually start to think of, about that. Thanks. So, so normally we would um, um, revise a strategy on an annual basis, but clearly if something significant comes along in the interim, then we can look at revising it uh, sooner than that. So, so something like this, it may well be that um, in the fullness of time, we do need to, to review the strategy in the light of what comes out of that. So maybe in six months' time, there might be a reason to review it again. So um, I, I think, um, I mean, it's been a little while since we did it, but I think there were good reasons for that, because we did need some clarity from, from the PWLB on, on lending terms, but certainly we can revise the strategy if something significant comes along again. I think that's a well-made point, and that probably ought to form one of the recommendations that we might send forward. Um, I, 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 I believe Anne Ainsworth would like to comment. Anne, please join us. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it was just to add a little bit more to the question around um, the economic development team and the commercial team and what we've been doing there. So um, essentially, as Peter was explaining, Adele and the business support team have now moved under underneath me in the council structure. And then we also added our colleagues who were in the investment team previously. So this was the team that sat under David Usby and had a number of colleagues who've been delivering on project management around commercial aspects and, and looking after some of our assets and our investments for us. And the purpose of doing that was to bring together those two skill sets so that we could create a, a true economic development team that looked at both physical assets and infrastructure, but also in terms of our support for businesses and our work with businesses across the, the district. And then our wider work with partners who cover both remits, such as the combined authority. So when we talk about the investment team uh, now, we're talking about a, a broader team comprising the business support team and the investment team as were. And we're also looking at the skill sets that we'll be requiring for the future. So we're doing a review of what we will need to make sure that we have the offices and the skill sets in place to deliver on the future investment strategy. Thank you, Chair. Good. Thank you, Anne. That's very helpful. It's important. Councillor Peter Fain. Chair, thank you. Uh, just, I asked a question earlier on in relation to Ermin Street. I, for the record, I should have declared that I'm the director of Ermin Street. Uh, thank you. Councillor Aidan van der Waal. Thank you very much for letting me come back, uh, especially as it, um, it was a point of, of accuracy about what I said. I, I am very confident that my statement previously about the yields required in the, pre in the current investment strategy was correct. I just checked at the investment strategy that was adopted by the Council in November 2019. It says the minimum target yield for stream to investment is 2.5%. Um, so th th there's an issue there in, in, in relation to content of the, of the report, the, the, the proposed strategy that I think needs to probably ironing out before it goes to the next stage. Um, but but I, I mean, I, I would appreciate some, some view on, on, on how the, the, this balance between uh, commercial yield, financial gain, and um, wider public benefit is dealt with in, in, the, in the new investment strategy, uh, and, um, and whether the yield needs to be incorporated some way into the criteria matrix, uh, which I didn't really get a response to previously. Probably, probably one for Councillor Williams, I think. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I, we really must get away from, you know, the, the current three streams. You know, this is a different setup to what went before. And if you look on, as I say, if you look on the table on 8.45, um, I think, that I sets out the, the yields that we are proposing for the new um, criteria, for, for the new classification. And the classification that covers um, service um, investments which cover things like amenities, housing and that sort of thing is still 2.5%. Yeah. 
the, what I think is being referred to is the fact that what was previously stream one investments, which were com purely commercial investments and therefore were at, um, we were looking for a yield of 5% or more, those have flowed into the commercial investments which we will be looking at and justifying, like 270, for example. 270, to my mind, can be qualified under the new Public Works Loan Board rules because we are provide, we are, what we've done is we are providing units for startups. We're taking an existing office block and we're dividing it into five units for startups. That was done under the previous uh, commercial investment stream one, which was looking for a 5% yield. And we have basically just transferred that across to the new commercial investment uh, stream um, category, which is looking for improvements for growth, etc. And what we're saying is that we are looking for a 5% yield on those business, you know, growths. Now, maybe the council believes that we should be looking for less yield when we come to support um, business and growth in the area, but I think it's, it's felt that there is sufficient, we don't need to do that. And uh, we would, um, you know, with the, there is an expectation that for those types of investments that a 5% yield is, is, is acceptable. As I say, when we're looking at more socially, you know, the provision of more social amenities, then we are looking at 2.5%, which is no different to what we did, what we're doing now, because we haven't adopted that, the, the new um, strategy yet. So, um, that, that's, that's my view, that, that we actually still have 2.5% yield on those social things uh, under the new um, um, service investments. There's no change there. Thank um, you. And that's, that's what I mean. Thank you, you may take a different view. No, it's, it's in black and white. Yeah, Council of Underwood. It, it might be in black and white and more in front of us, but if, 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 if you want to go there, John, I will. The, the table in 8.4.5 does not accurately represent the changes from the previous investment strategy. I'm sorry. Stream 1, I'm looking at it now, Stream 1 had 5% across there, Stream 2 had 2.5%, and um, uh, Stream 3 had 5%. Um, uh, so the, 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 the first row and the second row have been inverted. Um, I, I, I think that would so be that, a, that's in terms of the black and white, the accuracy. But, but the, the, the other point is um, the, the types of investments in, the, in what is now commercial regeneration are largely the same as what is in stream two. You, 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 you seem to be saying that stream that the service um, strategy, service um, investments are just stream two convert, moved over, but they're not investing in social capital, rebuilding council-owned assets, building homes and commercial premises. Is, is what stream two was, and that was the requirement was two point five percent on that. Um, uh, and now it's been put up to 5%. And, and uh, um, uh, uh, if you're telling me that, that that's deliberate, that then, then, uh, then I, I uh, want to know uh, a bit better of an explanation of that and, and how we are going to um, try and balance between uh, losses to commercial um, uh, financial gain and those, and those um, uh, social benefits, which, is, which was the whole point of stream two and which is not... Um, uh, set out, I'll say it, say it bluntly if, you, if you're going to argue with me like that, uh, it's not set out clearly about how we do that in, in this new strategy. So, um, it's obviously not entirely clear, so perhaps could we have a chat outside the meeting maybe, uh, Councillor Underway? Yeah. But um, obviously what we're saying here is that stream, stream 2 may well have been 2.5%, Commercial investments in Stream 2 are not the same thing. They're, they're different things entirely. So if, if, perhaps if we have a, a discussion outside the meeting, maybe, maybe we can try and clarify that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
I, I think at that point. Um, I've just got two very quick questions. Um, on the next item, we're going to be talking about um, empty homes. I wonder if one of the areas that we might include in our um, investment strategy is whether we could actually acquire by agreement some of those empty homes and um, make them available for people to live in, perhaps through Ermit Street. I'll leave you that one to think about. And just in terms of the space, the commercial office space that we have available, can I just confirm, at this time it's approximately one third of the Victron building and the whole of number 270 on the Cambridge Science Park? Yes, thank you. Um, those are my questions. Can I just make the point that one of the things that um, a couple of us have expressed concern about is the um, office conversion to residential. I think that's something that we ought to look at. Um, certainly, I believe that Councillor Harvey's point about um, climate change is a very important one. We ought to be looking at that. Uh, and clearly, there is an issue to be ironed out in these um, returns, you know, rate investment rate returns. And I'd just like to see that resolved. Um, but with that, am I um, correct in reading that the uh, majority of the meeting is content for those comments to go forward um, to the uh, Cabinet meeting on the 6th of December? Agree. Thank you all very much indeed. And Councillor Williams and Peter Maddox, thank you very much for your contributions. Councillor Bradley. Is everybody okay? Does anybody need a call? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Does anybody need a pause? Because we've been going since four o'clock. Is everyone happy to continue or would you like a break? I'm, ha I'm happy to continue. Thank you. Um, agenda item nine is the empty home strategy. And we're joined online by Councillor John Batchelor. Councillor Batchelor, would you like to introduce your report? I would indeed, Chair. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully this isn't a contentious item. So it's the empty homes strategy, uh, and it's essentially uh, formalising the process uh, for us to um, try and bring back into use uh, empty homes in the district. Um, this isn't a huge problem. Uh, we have currently 870 properties that have been empty for more than six months. To put that into context, uh, that's 0.3% of uh, the housing stock in the district. Um, of those, uh, 663 have been empty for six months to two years. Uh, and 207 uh, have been empty for more than two years. Now, uh, as long as these properties are kept in good order and the relevant tax is paid, then there is very little that, that we can do about um, bringing them back into use. These, uh, you know, it's the choice of the owner to do as he wishes with those. So what this strategy is basically um, looking to deal with is a small number of what I might describe as nuisance properties uh, that have been left um, to deteriorate and are becoming an issue locally. Uh, there's really quite small numbers of these. Um, uh, in the last year or so, we've had no more than five to ten um, complaints from the public about uh, this sort of housing um, in, in that time. So what can we do about uh, bringing housing back into use? Um, there's two tools that are available to us. The first is if um, the owner of the property refuses to uh, actually repair or deal with the situation, 
then there is a course for us to actually take um, over the property and make the repairs and the um, uh, tidying up ourselves and we then charge the uh, the owner. The other um, course of action which is very much a last resort is to go for a compulsory purchase. Uh, I might say that both these courses of action are time consuming and expensive. So the real tool that we attempt to use is actually persuasion since uh, that is a good deal cheaper. So um, that's basically what um, the strategy is about. Um, I've given the bones of that. If, if Chair, you would like um, some more flesh on those bones, then we do have Julie Fletcher with us, who's a head of housing strategy who I'm sure uh, could give us um, fuller explanation if you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, I think we'll probably ask for questions from members. And uh, if it's necessary for you to call upon Julie to respond, then I'm sure you will do so. So, members. Councillor Steve Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I take the point about it being a relatively small number in South Cams, but nevertheless, where they are in the significant status repair and being neglected for many years, they do cause a lot of upset and anxiety for the neighbours and the parish council. Um, and I do note that you know you have a number of options here, EDMO and CPO listed on our page 109. Um, and I wonder how often those are actually used or are they ever used? And what is the gate you know, what, what is the trigger for actually doing one of those things when a property has been a nuisance for many years? Um, we have one in our ward at the moment that's been empty for 10 years, and we've, we have tried to work with officers uh, to get that resolved, and there was sort of a little bit of an initial tidy up, but then the owners have disappeared again. You know, at what point is it, do we say, no, we've got to do something, and let's use one of these courses of action? Um, and, and actually, I'd also like to say, I thought the chair's suggestion uh, at the end of the last item was a very good one. Um, why don't we buy these up and then while they're empty, golden opportunity to fit them out with the best possible insulation and stuff, um, and then use them as an investment. Thank you. Councillor Bachelor, did you wish to take that or? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'll start with that, certainly. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that all mem members will have anecdotes uh, about um, nuisance properties in the area, I, I certainly do. Uh, so when I was told that we only have five to ten complaints a year, I was really quite surprised. Um, I'm sure uh, I'll, I'll call on Julie in a, in a moment who may uh, add something to that. It's not a simple matter uh, to you know, buy the properties. Um, there has to be cooperation. If there isn't cooperation, uh, then it, you have to go through a substantial legal system. Now, um, this comes at the moment under our general enforcement, people with environmental health, and sometimes with planning. Um, there is a proposal here now to actually uh, employ somebody who, who can uh, spend full time on uh, pursuing this because when we do take this sort of course of action, um, it, it is uh, very time consuming. Uh, I don't think we've done it very often, but I'm sure Julie could add um, some detail to that. Um, if that's okay with you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. Um, yes, if I may just add to Councillor Bachelor's what he summed up, really. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the, you know, we only have sort of five to ten sort of complaints a year in terms of empty homes. 
but like you say, you know, for a village where the impacts on that neighbourhood, it is still an impact and it's not good. And we recognise that, I think, really in terms of at the moment within um, the council, we have various different departments working at different times on different strands regarding an empty property. What we're looking to do is be much more proactive in that. And as Councillor Batchelor said, we're looking to hopefully recruit a dedicated officer who will be the point of contact for all sort of complaints to do with empty homes and will be able to coordinate that much better. We've also um, got an, an internal enforcement working group now, which again brings together all those departments to make sure we have a much more joined up approach. Because I do feel that was slightly missing probably previously. So we'll, we've looked at that and we've tried to strengthen on that. And finally, there's a sort of a partnership forum that we're looking to establish with Huntingdonshire and Cambridge City, which is really around sort of best practice, looking at individual cases and looking at what's the best course of action. In terms of um, compulsory purchase orders and empty dwelling management orders, as far as I'm aware in my time here, and it has been for quite a considerable time actually, um, I'm not aware that we've ever actually done any. And I think nationally it's very few and far between as well. I think the issue is that you need such a lot of evidence gathering over a period of a lot of years to be able to take that through to the courts to get any sort of um, resolution on that. Um, so it is really difficult and you have to prove really in terms that it, it's got to be because of the public interest. There has to be um, a real public interest in terms of taking something like that through to the courts. Um, and just on that point, I understand that we are looking to do a corporate enforcement policy and that's going to give a bit more guidance in terms of what that public in interest test would look like. Um, so it's not something we've done in the past. Um, and as Councillor Bachelor said, it is very staff intensive and very costly. So we do have to weigh that up again as well. I think I've answered, have I answered everything that was asked? No, thank you very much, yes. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Claire Daunton. Um, well, I think Julie's um, mostly answered my question, which was about the challenging buildings working group. Um, and it sounds as if it hasn't really quite got off the ground yet. I guess, yes, you're, you're nodding. Um, and I suppose then, have you been able to um, gather any evidence concerning our, how South Cams handles this kind of thing in relation to other councils? Do our other councils more active in um, pursuing empty buildings? If, if I may answer that, Chair. Julie, please do. Yes, thank you. Um, just on that, I know that the City Council are probably more active, to be fair, than um, South Cams because of the more sort of urban um, area and the intensity, perhaps, of some of the empty properties and the issues they have with empty homes. So they do have an actual empty homes officer, I understand, who has that you know, it's that dedicated resource to that, and that is something that we want to look at. And then we can be much more proactive, I think, than what we've, we've been before. Um, in terms of success rates, though, in sort of um, sort of going to court and, and taking CPOs, et cetera, I understand that they, that I think they've tried previously at the city, but um, have had some real difficulties in taking that through. So I think the forum really is about learning from each other and that experience, because I think it is not an easy route to go through in terms of trying to take that enforcement. Julie, uh, John, can I just ask, is it your intention to uh, bring this position forward in the budget for the Next year. Yes, thank you. I yes, yes I believe it is. Yeah. yeah, good. Thank you. So that may well help. Yes. Councillor Peter Fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just mention that uh, actually the, the complaints that I've had as a councillor in relation to empty properties have, um, have, have related to long term empty properties owned by the council. Um, I'm glad to say that those are now um, under repair. Um, but I suspect when, we, when it says in the first paragraph, letters were sent to all owners of properties registered with Council Bank, 
the owners of those particular properties maybe didn't get the letter. Um, I mention that because I think it's important, and I don't think it's reflected in the stats, to look at the, the nature of ownership, uh, as well as the, state, the current status of occupation. Um, we have, of course, a lot of social housing, not just owned by the district council. We have a lot of jointly owned property, where there may be particular problems, because, of course, the, the owners of that, if they can't live in it themselves, they can't let it, because we have a policy of not lifting the covenant against letting, and they can't sell it because those properties are very difficult to sell. And so sometimes they remain um, empty for a long period without the owner being able to, to do anything about that. Um, now, there was reference, John Batchelor referred to the two tools to bring houses back into use. In fact, as Judith Fletcher said, we haven't used either of those. There is, I think, a third tool, which was referred to both by Steve Hunt and by, by you, Chair, which is of purchasing by agreement. And I think we should be open to that. We have, as I understand it, a policy of not purchasing by agreement, even when offered at a discount. Um, John and I have been talking about a particular case of that. And I think we should perhaps consider where, whether, if, we, if it isn't practical to compulsory purchase or indeed do an EDMO, it might be practical to purchase by agreement, probably at a discount, and we should not set our faces against doing that. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm not sure there was a question there, was there, Peter? Uh, yes. Go, go on. Chair, the question was whether the uh, suggestion you made and that Councillor Steve Hunt made uh, of purchasing by agreement could be considered. Thank you. John, I think that's one for you, Councillor Batchelor. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's other routes for, for this. I mean, Ermine Street is, is the obvious one, uh, and also via Shire Homes. Um, I'm not sure it's really uh, part of this particular strategy, uh, but I'm sure Julie might wish to add to that. Uh, yes, please, Chair, if I may. Um, we, we do have in the strategy in terms of um, signposting to both Ermine Street Housing with the potential to purchase properties, but obviously Ermine Street Housing, you know, it has to be viable for them to purchase that property in terms of they've got to get that yield on that as well in terms of um, the rental yield and making sure that that it, you know, it's going to make them money as well. So, so there are issues there if the property is in too disrepair and needs a lot of work doing, then again, that's a, that's a cost to Omen Street if they were to purchase that. So they have to balance that up and they have to look at that as a business, I guess. We also signpost to um, our lettings company, Shire Homes Lettings, whereby the owners keeps the asset, but we let out the property, usually to people who may be faced with homelessness, and we can guarantee the rent on that. So that's also quite a, a good avenue in terms of, um, you know, <clears throat> helping to bring properties back into use. In terms of purchasing properties at a discount, if we were offered a discount, then I'm sure someone like Ermine Street, that would probably be very attractive, to be fair. Um, as I say, it's got to be the price. The price is right, really, in term, terms of that. We don't have any resources set aside within the council um, to purchase through the HRA. So we tend to put all of our, our funds into new build now because actually economies of scale, it, it's much more viable to do that. Come back briefly. Um, this is relevant to... Um, Paragraph 6.2 on page 105 in relation to Shah Homes, that the particular case I was referring to of part owned properties, and there is a lot of demand for single bedroom flats, uh, that doesn't work for Shah Homes or for Ermine Street, as John will know from a particular case we've been discussing. Um, and therefore, I think if we're to investigate this other option of purchase by agreement, we need to consider how that can be done not merely to assume if it can't be done on the, under the HRA, then Ermine Street or Shire Homes will pick it up. We know that they won't. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions here. And 
they relate to the data. I, I also wanted to say thank you very much. I suspect it's Julie Fletcher's team who've created this excellent questionnaire. So thank you very much for the questions that you asked, the way that you asked them and the way that you presented them, because I think it's all very clear. So thank you very much for that. Um, and, and for that reason, since it looks such a very straightforward questionnaire, I'm really kind of curious as to why, I mean, we know this, don't we, with questionnaires, but I'm surprised that there's only been a 30% response rate. And so I've got a question there, but I'll come back to that. But the other one is that, um, and you've explained why, you know, 27% of the response respondents answered they're no longer the owner of the property. And that, that comes out of the fact that you only sort of check every couple of years when council tax gets changed. But so actually this data only refers to 122 respondents. And yet we know there's 830 something or, odd, or other in total. So this is sort of like a sixth of the total empty properties. So, right, this is a shooting in the dark question, perhaps maybe for Julie, but um, it's kind of why haven't the other five, six responded? <laughs> Maybe Councillor Bachelor would like to direct that one, but have we any idea why the other five, six didn't re reply? Do you, do you want to take that one first? Chair, sorry if that's okay. Um, Councillor Bachelor, did you wish to respond or Julie? Well, I, I think Ju Julie will give the response, but uh, obviously. We, we, we don't know a negative, do we? No. Well, yeah. but, I, but I wondered if Julie might have some insight. Yes, all right. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, to be honest, um, Councillor Braddon, I, I don't know why they don't respond. It, it may, I think a, a lot of it is um, some of them who, who own the empty property, they've got plans for that empty property. They know what they want to do with it. They're quite happy having to pay double council tax, it's not a real issue for them. So therefore, they're not really bothered to engage with the council, if I'm honest, in terms of that respect. Um, that That's the only sort of reason I can really think of, to be fair. I mean, one of the things we did say before was we, we used to have a grant scheme to actually help people bring empty homes back into use. It was only, a, well, it only, it was a £10,000 grant and we would then... Um, there was a restriction that we could then let that property out for a certain period of time. But there was no take-up, so there feels like there's real sort of apathy, I think, within the district in terms of those um, owners of empty homes to actually engage with the council and actually bring them back into use. They've got reasons why they're empty, to be fair. That's the majority, but it's not all of them. I accept that. Thank you. So if I may come back with my second question, Chair. So, thank you. That that's um, that's the sort of feeling I'd got from the data too. That they actually they're not fussed. <laughs> so because we've got it in in lots of places in the in the data. So we've got um, on page 115. Why is it currently empty? I'm trying to sell it. Is the vast majority at 40, with 24% it's being repaired, and then. Over the page at 116, what do you plan to do with the property? I want to sell it. But actually, cost of repair not being a problem, you know, that they're quite happy. They can do that themselves. But does the property cause you any issues? Um, lots of people said, no, it doesn't cause me any issues. Um, but the problem is that means we've got properties that are empty, that are not providing housing. And you've said it in the report. It's not a problem for the owners, but it's a problem for us, knowing that such a large proportion of our housing stock is not being utilised. And so, um, and indeed, looking at the data on page 117, um, you know, 663 of these properties have been empty over six months. Well, that's understandable if you're dealing with probate or, you know, trying to sell it or whatever. But 207 have been empty for over two years. And... What I'm slightly wondering is, South Cam's we know is a very attractive area for investment because people know that property, house, property prices are likely to stay high. And so what I'm slightly concerned about, and I'm not sure there's anything we can do about it, um, is 
are people just sitting on properties because they know that they're going to be secure in terms of their value? Or, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, they might want to hand them on to their children or you know, whatever, um, or live in them in due course. But what I'm slightly concerned about is, I wonder, do we have any feeling about whether any of these properties are being bought up and simply kept as investments in land in this district for the future? And this might be, um, and I know we have no control about who buys houses, but I just wonder, is this um, something, you know, you said people are not bothered about having twice the, cap the council tax. And I just wondered whether we've ever thought of putting that up any higher, because actually what we want to do is engage with these properties and, and enable them to be used for housing in the district, not just as investment properties for some very distant future. Um, so I, I suppose, sorry, I'm getting to a question, promise. Um, you know, have we thought about increasing that multiple of council tax at all? to encourage people to bring these into use? Or are, is it maybe um, money from overseas that's just giving somebody a stake in South Cams? Um, and do we have any control? I suspect not. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, <coughs> Off you, I would have thought, John. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, there's no evidence for, for that. and. You know, let, let's keep it um, in proportion. What we're talking about with the uh, houses being empty for more than two years there is, is less than 0.1% of all housing in, in South Cams. So it, it's, it's not a large number. Uh, no evidence that the, there's any plots, as far as I know, to um, hold large amounts of land for any other reason. Um, so uh, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Julie. Could I come in, John, if that's OK? Oh, yes, Peter Campbell. Yeah, um, yeah um, to be honest, Councillor Bradman, we don't know the answer to some of those questions that, that, that you've raised. Uh, and the, the role for the proposed empty um, uh, homes officer will be initially carrying out some additional uh, research and door knocking uh, in much more in depth than we're able to do with the existing resources. So you know, we, we can't answer your, your your question now, but hopefully within the first you know, uh, six months or so, the officer start to be able to will be able to uh, uh, get back to you um, with that. But I'd also like to come back to the earlier point about um, uh, the council buying properties. The challenge will be that if the council was to buy properties, um, there are a number of barriers, not least being the affordability and the viability um, for the council to um, to buy and rent out properties. We are limited the amount of rent that, that, that we can charge. Um, but more than that is that when the, uh, the right to buy rule or, or the use of right to buy receipt rules were changed uh, relatively recently, what they also did was put some some really um, tight restrictions uh, on how the how the, the the right to buy receipts could could be spent, um, and there was a a widespread restriction on buying uh, on using the, the the money to buying the existing uh, existing houses. So it will be very, it's very difficult to see how you know, uh, buying on the open market would um, would stack up financially for the council. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Councillor Martin Khan. <coughs> so, coming back, actually, uh, Councillor Fain has already referred to a point that I was going to do. There's two points I really want to look up. First of all, regarding EDMOs, um, when we had the problem which uh, Councillor Hunt referred to in, in, in our local village, um, the, the, it turned out that the house was empty because of a, a marital uh, affair. It had come back to the, uh, to the wife. Uh, and she knew about it, but really hadn't done anything about it. It's been referred back, but it appears to me that the reason why nothing had been done is because she couldn't face the business of doing it up. 
Uh, it's not necessarily, not everybody is expert at doing that, it's a specialized field. And yet the obvious way out of that, because very likely she wants to maintain her ownership of the property, you know, as you say, it might be for children later on and for all sorts of reasons, is via Shire Homes. But Shire Homes will only buy, buy, uh, take a lease property which is already managed and restored. And it seems to me that there is an opportunity that we ought to be looking at, and, and the empty homes officer perhaps should be looking at, that they sh should offer. We have, we have already a, uh, a council housing service which deals with managing and doing up property and re refurbishing property, so we, we should have the skills available to be able to do that. Uh, and the simple thing is to lease, we, we cover all the costs of improvement and a margin to cover our costs. Uh, 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 and that would give the, uh, the, the person can take all the property, the, the concerns out of the property concerns, not to bind up the property internally, uh, and would get the property back into use. Uh, because after all, the, uh, the tenant, uh, the, the owner, will then get an income from this property which had been sitting there and doing nothing up to now, and it's been paying council, they've been paying council tax on it. So that struck me. Uh, in terms of the survey, it uh, struck me that uh, it made maybe you had one sixth of people replying, but you're going to have an inevitably biased result because the sort of person like this, which doesn't want to be dealing with it, is not going to be responding. So the problem people are not going to be responding, and you're going to have biased results. And hopefully that your officer will therefore be able to follow up these things and see if we can find out more. The second point was about EDMOs. The officer who came out and dealt with this, I won't mean that, uh, had previously worked for South End uh, District Council and commented that they had used them a lot, that nationally they're not being very well helped to use, but that particular council had used them, had developed, developed a system and it worked really, relatively smoothly. So it is possible to use them, clearly. Some people have managed. Uh, and I think it would be worthwhile looking into that and seeing how it is done in those authorities which do do it successfully, because it obviously is potentially a very useful tool. Um, so these are really more comments to you than, than vice versa. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, was it? You, so I think that, that was our final speaker on this point. So um, we have, I think, considered uh, in some detail your proposed strategy and a number of us have made the point that we would like you to consider um, purchase by agreement and uh, also um, Councillor Bradnam's point that uh, you might wish to look at increasing the council tax on uh, those properties which remain empty for a period of time. But subject to those and other comments that are made, is everyone content that we approve recommend this to go forward to Cabinet and for, um, for public, for further, I think, public consultation first of all. And then ultimately to Cabinet. Thank you all very much indeed. So we come then to item 10 on the agenda, which is the work program. Um, I don't propose to spend a lot of time on that this evening. I'd ask you all to uh, consider it. There are some gaps there. Uh, please don't see that as a sign of um, meetings with little to talk about because there will be um, items coming forward in due course. Item 11 is to note the date of the next meeting, which is on Thursday the 16th of December in this room at starting at our normal time of 5.20 p.m. with a pre-meet on the Tuesday prior, so that will be the 14th at 4 p.m. With that, we have concluded our business for this evening. Can I firstly thank the officers um, for joining us and helping us out? My thanks to the cabinet members who have joined us. Thanks too to our chief executive who's been here. Um, and thank you all members for uh, your contributions to this meeting, this evening's meeting. Thank you very much. Have a safe journey home. <laughs>